Thank you. Thank you for the kind invitation to Berlin. And what I thought to do is because I realize I'm one of the last talks in between you and the end of the conference after, after lunch. So I thought I share some practical examples and give you 10 patient presentations and then one single take home message, which I hope will keep you out of court. So probably one of the biggest risks to patients in my practice is that once a patient has a diagnosis, that every subsequent loss of vision is attributed to this diagnosis. I'm a neurologist and we have a disease called multiple sclerosis and once a patient gets a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis, everyone thinks optic neuritis is the cause for visual loss. And it's such a big problem that in a nature review we highlighted it and I've seen a number of cases over the years. In being critical about my own profession, I want to share one patient who also permits me to make a link with artificial intelligence to the talks you heard yesterday. So this is going to be a practical example of artificial intelligence in daily practice, if you want. It's a young lady who has multiple sclerosis for 13 years, and she's on a very potent drug called natalizumab, and under this drug she then develops loss of vision, which progresses over four days, and the diagnosis of optic neuritis is made. She gets steroids, but vision does not improve. In fact, imaging of the brain and the optic nerve was normal, and vision continues to reduce to hand movements only, and about three weeks later only she presents to Morfield's Eye Hospital. And to this audience, I don't need to say that the retina you see here is not optic neuritis. This is retinal necrosis in the context of VZV vitritis. So this is a blind eye. Now, there was a collaboration between Morfields and Google DeMind, which led to a paper which... Um, I need to do it here, maybe. Do you see it up there? The Nature paper, which attracted quite a lot of attention, not only because of the classification in the right diagnosis, but probably more so because of the urgency with which a patient should be seen. And if you look at the original Heidelberg scans from this lady and you feed them into the algorithm we have now available, then she would come immediately into the semi-urgent to urgent group and probably would have had the chance to be seen much earlier for a diagnosis different to optic neuritis than what was assumed elsewhere. So while it is good to reflect on the mistakes in my own discipline, neurology, I also think you may hear some of the cases coming to me from your clinical practice. And this is a case from glaucoma, and it's a 56-year-old gentleman who was followed up for seven years for his PAOG, and the vision continued to deteriorate and eventually was sent to my clinic because of worsening of the fields. And I will share in this case, and also in all subsequent cases, the thickness map of the macular ganglion cell layer. So it's always going to be the same thickness map. And I put in this image a vertical red line just to highlight the vertical meridian. And if you walk in the evening and you look in the sky, and you see a half moon with some clouds coming over, it just has the same yellow shape as you see here in the... Um, I will try if I work it out. Yeah, here it is. That's the half moon here. It's a bit darker on this side and on the other as well. So there is hemiatrophy of the macular, and that is the first sign I will use for my take-home message, the half moon sign. You need to do brain imaging in these cases, and in more fields we went through all the patients who went through the glaucoma service, and you see a couple of images here. You see a beautiful donut of the ganglion cell layer in the control patient, and then you see the bitemporal hemiatrophy, bitemporal 
in the visual field by nasal in the retina, which makes a diagnosis of a pituitary adenoma. In fact, if you look at a large number of these patients, then if you look at the area under the curve of 0.96, there is an excellent possibility to diagnose this using the temporal to nasal um, ratio if compared to the general macular thickness map. And, and that is currently under revision with BGO. I think it just got resubmitted yesterday. So, staying in the same context, another patient from the glaucoma service who had asymmetric glaucoma, loss of vision in the right eye, down to count fingers, and then the very same day I'm asked, now the left disc is swollen, what, what do you do? And I will talk you slowly through this slide. So, um, first of all, you can see the atrophic here on the top in A, right eye, and then the swollen on the left side. So that is what you all learned from the textbook, a sign of what could be Foster Kennedy syndrome. And um, we sent him directly to brain imaging, which is adjacent to my clinic. And you can see this lesion standing here, obstructing the outflows and these dark cavities are both ventricles. They're so enlarged that you don't see any sulci anymore on top of the brain. And in fact, this patient was at risk to cone, which is the equivalent of dying, and went directly into the neurological hospital where I also work, where a surgical procedure was performed, a shunt inserted, and then you can see in the images, the E and so forth, that the swelling subsided. Now, I do want to use this particular case to introduce a second red line. I will give you three red lines. The first red line was vertical, and the second red line is something I put into the retina. I call it the rainbow sign. And if you look in the completely atrophic eye, and that is the figure S down here, then there's no ganglion cell left, but if you look just above it, where the red line sits, the inner nuclear layer is preserved. So even so, the entire ganglion cell layer is gone, a nerve is gone, you have preservation of the inner nuclear layer. And that is something you will observe in any form of pathology coming from the brain to the eye. It stops at the level of the inner nuclear layer, be it stroke, be it a cancer. And that is where I put the second line. Now, that is, of course, different to those episodes where you have sudden loss of blood supply, because the inner nuclear layer is susceptible to ischemia. And here is one lady who had, half a year ago, lost her vision. And then, as you know, we are not going through the best of times in the United Kingdom with the NHS. There's some delay to be seen by a doctor, so six months is a bit long. By the time she did turn up, the disc was already atrophic and pale. And I want to talk you slowly through this again. So the first red line was the vertical one through the macula. The second red line was the rainbow above the inner nuclear line. And now I will speak about a horizontal red line through the macula ganglion thickness layer. And the altitudinal visual field effect she had, which was superiorly, really beautifully matches the inferior loss of the ganglion cell layer you see down here. And all that comes with preservation, uh, with loss of the inner nuclear layer in the same area. And if you then look where I put the red lines here, between this one and this one, the inner nuclear layer has become ischemic. This is a situation where I prefer to have the OCT scan going vertically, if possible, which is what I show you in the next scan. That's a gentleman who has diabetes mellitus, sleep apnea syndrome, and then sudden loss of vision. In this case, he was seen acutely with a hyperemic swollen disc, and then at follow-up, that disc 
became atrophic. Again, an altitudinal visual field defect. And you will now see that in the OCT, there is preservation of the inner nuclear layer. So as before, you have altitudinal atrophy of the ganglion cell layer, but you have preservation of the inner nuclear layer. And if you look at the B scan, then you can see on both sides the inner nuclear layer is the same, but you beautifully can see that inner plexiform ganglion cell and RNFL are absent. And that's the situation where the vertical scan is very helpful because on the same B scan you can compare both sides. So this is what I call the sunset sign. There are, of course, those cases which are incidentally discovered. We had it with visual fields in the past, and that is a lady who was driving a car, she was perfectly fine, and then she was offered a free visual test. She did do very well, she did not need glasses, but incidentally, the visual fields did show a hominous hemianopia, and, but she did have no problem, she never did bump into people. And if you then look at the marker Lagrangian cell thickness map again, it's the vertical red line I present you here in A and B. So it's again what I call the half moon sign. I put it up on the top left of the slide. And in E and F, you see the preserved inner nuclear layer. And if you then look at the brain scan, I did circle it for you in purple. This is the area where she had possibly an early life injury which she has never been um, aware of, and this part of the retina never really developed. And like the blind spot, she was not aware of it and has completely adapted. So the retina helps you to look back at the brain, but whenever you see the vertical meridian, very, very similar to what you see in visual fields, it becomes a neurological problem. Then we had the COVID pandemic. And it was a very unusual time for us because we had to deal not only with the problems of COVID and the vaccination, uh, we also had to run a very, very special service. This is a 18-year-old lady who was known to the uveitis service prior to the pandemic and then woke up with early morning headaches. They were very, very severe, so she stopped having breakfast and the lumbar puncture opening pressure was 65 centimeters water. 20, 25 is what we think is normal, and that is her brain scan. And here you see the OCT before the pandemic, and that is when a headache started. Massively swollen optic disc. You see fluid seeping in. You can see deflection of Brooks membrane upwards. And then under treatment with acetazolamide, normalization in both eyes. So it's the only case I ever had in my own practice where I had an OCT prior to actually developing IIH, which then um, cured it. The next two cases, um, no, the AIDS case first is a complex case of someone who did have a back history of a cancer, then does lose vision, which is very, very painful, there are signs which do make us think of some meningeal irritation. We are worried she gets a brain scan, which is normal. Then we do a PET scan, which finds a gland, which is inflamed, and, but is an adenoma we find from in there. And finally, it's the OCT, which really gives the hint. So we can see subretinal fluid, and we spoke about the hyperreflective spots already. This was sarcoid. We did a treatment trial with steroids, and within hours the pain stopped, and she made a recovery. The last 30 seconds go to two cases in parallel. This is a lady who presented with a scotoma in which she did see these very curious tiling images. And the next one is a gentleman who, in exactly the same area, has the black spot. And if you compare both of them, the only difference is preservation of the inner nuclear layer. So you see the retinal nerve fiber layer, ganglion cell layer, indiplex form layer, preserved inner nuclear layer, 
and in this patient, then you also see this layer atrophied. So I do think there is a role for the inner nuclear layer in these type of symptoms, with which I come to wrapping it all up. I gave you three memnonics. They're meant to be remembered. Half moon, you must image, half the sunset sign and the rainbow sign. And the question then to the audience is, what do you do if a OCT does show you this image? A, do you measure the interocular pressure? B, do you follow up for another seven years in case there are any changes? C, do you repeat the OCT in a year's time? D, do you request brain imaging? Or E, do you discharge the patient back home? Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Persson. Thanks very much for a fantastic presentation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.